I need God to help me save three hundred dollars. You got me there back there, Brandon. Okay, I'm checking. Bye, guys. See y'all later. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Keep them doggies rolling. Testing, testing. Okay. Now that we got rid of the riffraff, hallelujah. It is so good to have all y'all in the house of God today. Thank you for coming and being out with us. I kind of think we're better together. And uh, so I'm glad that you're able to be here. Turn with me, in your, if you would, in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. 2 Corinthians 9, we're going to be looking at just a moment, but we're going to look at uh, Genesis chapter 8. We're talking about when harvests come. This time of year, Thanksgiving is, is a time of celebrating when the harvests have come in, the, the end of the crops, the end of the times, getting ready for winter season, and uh, a time of thankfulness for what the year has held. And uh, I want us to look at, in Genesis chapter 8, starting in verse 15, it says this, it says, Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so that they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in uh, number on it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground, all the birds, everything that moves on the land, came out of the ark, one kind after another. Verse 20, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. Somebody, mark that spot in your Bible, get yourself some brownies and some coffee, and take a very good look at that verse. Go back one real quick, Mr. Mike. Never again will I curse the ground, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. Oh, but the Lord knows my heart. Yeah, He does. <laughs> he knows your heart. <laughs> and it's terrible. Look at your neighbor say, He's, telling, he's talking to you. Talking to you. And he says, And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done, as long as the earth endures. Now I want you to see this. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. As long as the earth endures. These are laws that are established in pattern that will never pass away. Day and night, summer and winter, now in Texas, that's a little that's a little bit of a fuzzy line right there. You know what I'm saying? When we were living in North Arkansas up in the Ar up in the Ozarks, we had four seasons up there. And I tell everybody, man, that's so different from where I come from down around Colleen. We got two seasons. We got summer and February. You know, I mean just everything else happened in February. But as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest will never end. Seed time and harvest will never end. Thanksgiving in November, we're being thankful for the harvest we've had. Thankful for what the year's been. For some of you, it may be thankful that this year's almost over. I don't know. I don't know about you. I have some years that are just like, I'd rather forget those years, you know. And, but there, we have good times, we have good seasons. And uh, to be thankful for what God has done for us, how God has blessed us. My wife and I, when we sit around with our family this coming Thanksgiving, we're going to be able to say, because a year ago, man, I was gainfully unemployed. Today, I'm the pastor of the greatest church in Bell County. What? I love it. God blessed me. He may not have blessed y'all, but He blessed me. And we're thankful. We're absolutely thankful. And, uh... All right, this is what you're doing. This is what you need to be doing, okay? How come it's, you know, I'm, I'm, it's normally the back row that gives me trouble up here. All your trouble moved up. Hallelujah. So I get to keep a better eye on them. So, 
But no, God has blessed us. I mean, and matter of fact, this this coming Sunday, my wife and I are not going to be here. Uh, um, uh, Brother Ben Daniel is going to be preaching Sunday morning, this coming Sunday, because we're going to be parents next Sunday. Our youngest son is a youth pastor in BB, Arkansas, and he just recently received his license, his official ministry license. And uh, so he is now Reverend Jaden Sullivan. And so we're going to go be a part of, of a licensing induction ceremony at his church. And, uh, and I get the chance to preach uh, at his, his church. And uh, so, sorry we won't be here, but we're going to be a parent. Is that okay with y'all? All right. So we're thankful. A lot to be thankful for. But how many know not everybody has thankfulness? My wife and I yesterday, we were, uh, it was our turn to do the, the church service at our other campus at Maxdale Cowboy Church in our Liberty Hill campus there at Meridale Achievement Center at the uh, school for kids with problems. And we sat there with, a, and it was actually this particular day, it was just a group of boys that was there. And uh, so we had kind of a scaled down service. And uh, so I asked him, I said, guys, tell me what you're thankful for. And I had one young man. He said, I'm thankful for my family. I said, well, who's your family? Well, my, my dad's actually in jail. And my stepmom, well, she's there. My, my birth mom won't have anything to do with me. And I got siblings through them. I got siblings over here. And I really don't know any of them. And, and, and I'm like, how are you thankful for your family? And come to find out there's about two or three people that he is actually close to. Oh, he was adopted into, the, into a, a family. And, and uh, uh, so he, he really has none of his own family. But here he is at the marital school for troubled kids. Going to be there for a few months. And he says, I'm, now that I'm away from home, I'm thankful for, even though so many people have given me up, I'm thankful for the two or three that care about me. I had one say, I was like, what are you, what are you thankful for? He's like, skateboarding. <laughs> you know, didn't even mention family, didn't mention nothing. He's just, that's where they come from. It's where they come from. And uh, there was one that really troubled me. 15-year-old kid. And I said, what are you thankful for? And he said, I'm thankful for the 12 steps. And you get that. That apparently this kid is going through some kind of narcotics anonymous. Okay, now they're, they're at the school. And he said, because of the 12 steps, I'm learning how to overcome addiction and have a better life when I leave here. Fifth. And he's grateful for the 12 steps. Come on. Man, I'm 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 thankful when the Aggies stumble into a win this season. You know. I'm I'm thankful when I'm heading to Colleen and I hit the chaparral light and it's green. I'm especially thankful when I exit off Stan Schluter. And I hit that one green because if I don't, that's 10 minutes, honey, of waiting. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about on that crazy intersection. And I'm, you know, and it, it puts things into perspective of, well, I'm thankful for my new boots. I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful for that. And here's this kid saying, I'm just thankful somebody loves me. You see, we, we are people in this, this segment of time. This is our moment where we, we, and we ought to be doing this all year long, that I'm thankful for what my God has done for me. How many of you own a vehicle that if it had one more coat of paint on it, you would have dinged something really good? Thank God GM stopped on Friday and didn't paint no more. Or we would have took that mailbox out. I don't know about you, but... And when you put it into perspective, there's a lot we have to be thankful for, even in the moments where it's not so good. Can, when you consider that first harsh winter, when you consider that first harsh winter after the, uh, after the pilgrims landed, many had died. As a matter of fact, 
you're looking at a picture kind of like this, and I'll tell you, that's the Hollywood version of what was going on. But half the people that showed up one year earlier were dead by the time of this. So many of them were dying on a daily basis through the winter because they were so ill-prepared. They were not ready for what they had to face. If it wasn't for the graciousness of the natives that were there in the land to help them out, if it wasn't for them, they would not have... What few made it wouldn't have made it. They all would have perished. And so when this time came around... Uh, uh, the Indians had taught them how, about agriculture. They're locally. They began to flourish. Good things are happening. And they shared a meal of celebration and gratitude. I don't know that anybody got fat on that meal like what we're going to do on Thursday. But I will tell you, when they were eating that meal and they were gathered together, they were given thanks that they weren't buried in a shallow grave over there. They were thankful that they had made it into this new land with new friends to take care of them. And they were thankful that in this new land they could worship God the way they wanted to and not what was mandated by a king. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is about being thankful for receiving that first begins out of giving. When we give, we receive. Isn't that a biblical principle? If I give, then I receive. And that's what was taking place there. Is that by giving, by doing, then you start receiving. When we begin to sacrifice, I'll tell you the things I'm the most thankful for is where sacrifice was made. I'm grateful for gifts. But I'm thankful for what I worked hard for. You know what I'm saying? You got some sweat equity into that thing. That's my house. That's my truck. I'm grateful that of the sacrifices others have made for me. Man, I grew up in Killeen, Texas. You don't have you don't have nothing without remembering the military and those that died for your freedoms. I'm grateful for that heritage. I'm grateful for the sacrifices that were made. And sacrificial sowing, when we're giving and we're sowing, that leads to a grateful reaping. We had an old saying when we were living in, in Arkansas. I, don't, I, I never heard it here in Texas. But when somebody was starting to do something that was going to be uh, detrimental in the long run, they would say, hey, hey, don't eat your seed corn. Don't eat your seed corn. That took me a while to wrap my brain around hillbilly methodology. Down here in the flatlands, you know, I wonder what that meant. And it was because if you have corn seed, you can turn around and fix all that corn, that pot of corn, and you can make a couple meals out of that, or you can save that seed, plant it in the ground, and have a whole lot more corn. You don't eat your seed, you eat the reapings. How many times have you seen somebody when they get something and they turn around and spend it when instead they could have been investing that thing that could have made for a better reward? That's why we would encourage uh, kids. They'd be in stock shows and they'd go to sell their hog. They'd go to sell their sheep. They did really good. Woo, look at this money I get. I'm going to go blow it. And you say, wait, 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 wait. Don't eat your seed corn. Buy your next animals and then take what's left over. And you can play with that. Because you got what? You got a responsibility first. And so the sacrifice that we make, there's a blessing and a harvest that comes because we sow into the right places. But there is no blessed harvest without a sacrificial giving. There's no thanksgiving where there is no sacrifice. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, the Bible says this, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. We're all about the receiving. Come Christmas, we're all about the receiving. Christmas took on a whole new connotation for me when we had kids. Because suddenly Christmas was funner because of watching the kids play with the stuff. Well, actually, those first years, watching the kids play with the box and the wrapping paper and the bows. I'm playing with the Tonka truck, not my son. He's playing with the box the Tonka truck came in. 
But when we sow, we're sowing three things. God has given you three things to invest. Your time, your talents, and your treasures. Your time, because your time is limited. How many know your time is worth something? We were at a doctor's. I was at a doctor's office the other day. And I sat there for 45 minutes waiting on my doctor. And he didn't show up. So I left. Have you ever walked out of a doctor's office before? Okay, two of us. That's it. All right. I walked out. And I wasn't being ugly about it. And the doctor happened to be in the hallway. And he's like, Mike, Mike, wait, wait. I'm, I'm coming. I said, no. I said, I need you to understand something. I know your time is precious. It is. But your precious time doesn't make my time any less precious. And I scheduled an appointment immediately after lunch when I knew I could be seen. Is somebody hear me today? If you think your pastor has a bad attitude, pray for me. But I'm probably doing what every one of you wished you could have done. And I said, my time isn't any less precious than yours. Because I set aside this hour for you. And what we got to get done, we can't get done in 10, 15 minutes. I have to leave. You only have so much time. What are you spending your time on? What are you spending your time doing? What about the talents God has given you? God has given you talents, and you can use that talent. If it's not illegal or moral, you can use that talent for God. Bank robbing, not so much. Unless you pay half tithe. I mean, that, that, that's... Blood of Jesus, brother. Blood of Jesus. There are some things that are irredeemable. We used to say, this day, we used to say, if it's illegal, immoral, or fattening, don't do it. We stopped that last one. But God gives you a talent. Why can't you use that talent for God? Because God wants you to use your talent. If you got a rodeo talent, you can use it for God. You have an artistic talent, you can use it for God. You have a numerical talent, you're weird. <laughs> you just like math. You love math. Hallelujah. There are places for you. <laughs> I like my CPA, that's, that's where I want you. You, you can sing. You ought to be up here singing. You can play an instrument. You ought to be up here playing. I'm going to make this very awkward right here. Make it very awkward. You have a talent. Your time. Are you giving time to God? Your talent, are you giving to God? Your treasures. Oh, I knew he was going to get there. Preacher's talking about money. Man, you talk about money more than I do. Do you know the only people that don't like a message on tithing and giving are the people who don't tithe and don't give? I'll turn my head so I don't have to look at your faces. Those that know the principle of tithing and realize I am blessed when I give. I am blessed when I give because it's a spiritual principle. You see, and giving is more than just your money. But the Bible does say, bring your tithes into the storehouse of the Lord. You can give a gift, but it's not a gift until you tithe first. You need to understand that. Tithing didn't die in the Old Testament or New Testament. Tithing is still a spiritual principle. You know, I know people, they don't go to church and they won't call themselves a Christian, but they learn tithing and they tithe and their businesses are blessed. How on earth does that work? You don't even act like you love Jesus, but you give 10% of your income to a church and you're blessed. Well, I don't know. How's a brown cow eat green grass and give white milk? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm telling you, there's a spiritual principle here that does work. And you have these three things, your time, your talent, and your treasures. And they need to be given to God. Now, how do you like blessings in your life? Anybody in here like blessing? Four of you. Hallelujah. I like to be blessed. 
But we have to understand blessing follows two things. Faithfulness and obedience. If we are not faithful to God, if we are not faithful to His Word, if we're not living faithfully, why on earth would we demand His faithfulness? Why would we demand His blessing? Man, let me tell you something. I know I don't deserve a thing. I don't deserve a thing. I am a sinner being saved by grace. I still have that propensity to sin. I found out I sinned last night. No, I'm not talking about the Longhorn game. No, I, I, I wasn't cheering for him, so I was in the right. No, no. Have y'all knew Florence has a bar? I didn't know that. So the FFA, I'm a proud FFA alumni. We have our 75th anniversary, Brother Bill. And I go down there to Slate of what? Oh, you know about it. Okay, okay. So I, <laughs> I, I, to nobody in particular over here who pointed my sin out, so I go to Salado Creek because that's where the 75th anniversary of Florence FFA was. I go rolling up in there. That's a smooth bar. I mean, they don't serve a lick of food. They're not even pretzels up there, man. But I'm over there. and, and So <laughs> the preacher was in a bar last night, okay? It, it just... Honoring FFA, but I want it out there before before word gets out, okay? So bear with me on that. But our faithfulness and our obedience go, uh, go before us so that blessing follows. And this is who God calls us to be. God's idea of giving in any situation in your life is a system. It's a system of blessing. It protects what you have. It's not a crucifixion process. Most people, when you talk about giving, it's fine, pull out my wallet, what do I got to give? Hey, we need some help hauling some, some stuff upstairs or decorating trees. Oh, fine, if this is what I got to do. How do you know the giving of your time, the giving of your talents, the giving of your treasures leads to greater blessing in your life? In your life. And I'll tell you as a pastor, I want you blessed. Because when you're not blessed, you're cranky. Amen. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Preach it, brother. Yes. Amen. You're cranky when you're not blessed. I want you blessed. I want good things happening in your life. I love seeing your bright, shiny smiles. And but blessing follows faithfulness and obedience. And so giving is not a sacrificial, this, this crucifixion process of, oh, this is terrible. Oh, this is horrible. No, it's supposed to be a thing where God not only blesses what you give, but He protects what you keep. He protects what you keep. So I want us to, we're going to end today, and I want us to look at this scripture real quick. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. As we get ready to go into Thanksgiving, I want you to consider this. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who gives generously will get a generous crop. You know, I've found that the people who are most generous in their life are the ones that are the happiest. They're the happy. Now, I'm not going to get real political here. But when it comes to charitable giving, there is one political party that is by far more charitable than the other. And I look at the people, and the one that does not give Man, they're mad. They're angry. They burn cars. They riot. Some of y'all know exactly who I'm talking about. But I'm not being political. Hallelujah. But I have found that those that... And this, this, this is true. When you give generously, you reap generously. You're blessed. The more seed I use, the more 
I get back. The purpose of this writing, this whole thing that we're looking at, was because the Apostle Paul was trying to take up an offering to help the struggling believers that were in Jerusalem. He's trying to get a missions offering out of them. He's trying to say, look, there's a need and we want to help them. They're your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the easy thing that would be would be to say, why should I give? What's in it for me? God help us when we say, why should I serve? Why should I do? Why should I give? What's in it for me? Your blessing is what's in it. Your joy is what's in it. Generosity is a valid litmus test as to the amount of God's grace that is inside of us. Now, there are some things I don't like giving to. You'll very seldom see me stop at an intersection over here in town where somebody's flying a cardboard sign and hand out money. You know why? I've done too much homeless ministry. Some of those jokers make more money in a day than I do. Than you do. And they have nothing to show for it because they burn through it with alcohol, drugs, whatever. I don't want to enable them. Do you know, I've bought people say, man, we'll work for food. I go buy them food and give it to them and they give me a cussing. I don't want your food, I want your money. They get honest about it. It's not that I don't like giving, but sometimes it's hard to give to certain people. But I will tell you that if we're not a generous people, there's not a lot of grace inside of us. I'm just saying it like it is. Start verse 7, go to the next one. And you must each decide in your own heart how much to give or what to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives how? How often do I even talk about giving to you? You got boxes back there. Put your money back there because it helps make stuff happen. How many of you like the air conditioning in the summer? How many of you like the heating in the winter? How many of you like going to the bathroom and there's toilet paper? Unfortunately, this is a business and it takes money to operate it. But I'm grateful for those that give. I don't I don't force it down your throat saying, Oh, shame on you, shame on you, you need to give, you need to give. No. I, I want you to give because it says God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide for all you need, then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to what? As the scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor, their good deeds will be remembered. How long? Hmm. I'm just going to let that kind of sink in. Because I want you to understand, God loves it when we are givers. When we're not selfish. This is why I love this church. Because y'all do stuff like this. And you, and you you pay to send kids to camp who may not be able to uh, afford camp. And there's, there's different ways this church is generous. And I want to say, church, don't stop. If something is causing you to be blessed, don't stop it. Don't stop it. Now, if I understood why UT keeps winning, I would stop that. Because that's not blessing, that's spiritual warfare. Something is wrong. Verse number 10. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, He'll provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of what? Woo! This is the Word of God, not Mike Sullivan. God loves it when we are a giving people. Why? Because God is a giving yes, he person. Is. God, is, yes. God is a giver. And this is who He desires us to be like. What did Paul say? Imitate me as I imitate who? Christ. So the Bible goes on. they saying that He'll provide for your provision. And He gives you the opportunity to give. The ability to give. Verse 11. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will what? Have you ever had something given to you and it was right on time? Man, I was, I've had moments where I was in college starving. I actually had tapeworms at work back in that day. And I was so hungry. It was a Sunday. Everything closed. I'm broke. I can't get back to the campus to eat the cafeteria. When I do get back there, it's going to be closed. And I'm starting to have low blood sugar issues working at Walmart as a stockman. 
Man, I am struggling. You try pushing 20 carts. We didn't have those motorized mules back in that day. This was the motorized mule back then. And I thought, dear God, I'm, I'm going to die. I need some help. And I sat back there in the back of Walmart and I said, Lord, I don't know what you're going to give, but I'm believing you're going to send me something because you what love me? And you care about me. And I'm walking out the door, heading to my dorm room for a lunch break because there's nothing there waiting for me. And as I'm walking through, a guy walks by with a styrofoam box. I say, hey, Don, what you got in your hands? He's like, oh, man, they, I don't need this. I don't want it. I just brought it. and I don't, Here's a couple chili dogs in here. Best food I ever ate in my life. What happened? God provided you will be enriched in every way so that you will always be generous. And when we take your gift to those who need them, they will what? Thank God. Let me tell you something. I was thanking God that day. Think about the moments where somebody was generous with their time, their talent, their treasure, and helped you. And we thank God and said, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have made it. So two, good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. Mm, verse 13. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all the believers who will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift too wonderful for words. So let's close here today. In a few days, we're going to be sitting down at a table, eating some turkey, some ham, ribs, no. clams, I don't know, whatever, however you celebrate Thanksgiving. We're going to sit down and we're going to eat. And hopefully we're with family. Hopefully it's a good time. But I will tell you this, before we do anything, we ought to take a moment and say, Lord, thank You for all that You've done in my life. Because without You, I wouldn't be where I'm at. I wouldn't have what I have. And even if, listen, even if 2023 has been hell on earth for you this year, there's still something good to thank God for. If nothing else, this year's almost done. And 24 is going to be a better year. God is good. Let us be good like Him. Giving thanks for all He's done and then being ready to do a good work so that others are saying not only thank you God, but thank you for what you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Lord Jesus, I pray right now that we are not a greedy, selfish people, but instead, Lord, we are people who love You and we're grateful for You. We're grateful for all You do. Forgive us, Jesus. Forgive me for those moments where I've been selfish and, and too self-serving and to, to do what is right. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive us of these sins. Forgive us of the moments where, Lord, You wanted us to sow. You wanted us to give of our time, of our talents, of our finances. That, Lord God, instead we said, no, I'm not going to do it. Father, forgive us for our disobedience. We want to be blessed, but, Lord, if we're going to be blessed, we've got to be faithful and obedient to You. So, Lord, I pray, help us, challenge us this Thanksgiving season. Help us, Lord God, as we're closing out. We're coming to the close of a year. Help us, Lord, to have a made-up mind that, Lord, in this next year, I want to do better. I want to see more. I want to become more for You. Lord, I love You and I thank You for this day. I thank You, Lord God, for how You provide. I thank You, Lord God, for our friends that You've, that you've brought our way. Lord, I just thank You. I want to ask you, church family, if you would, very unselfishly, because I know I'm getting into your lunchtime. But the Beaver family just had to walk out of here a few minutes ago. Their daughter uh, was passing out. Her blood pressure is pretty high. And she's not very old. Can we take a moment and pray for the Beaver family right now?
Come on, join me. Father God, you know what's going on. You know what's going on with this young lady. Lord, she's way too young to be having blood pressure problems. And the fathers are heading to the hospital. Keep them safe. Be with the doctors and nurses and help them, Lord God, to know what to do, to know how to help. And that, Father, we're believing for a touch in her body, her mortal body, Lord God. Heal her from whatever this is. And, Lord God, let this be a thing where it's a testimony of the goodness of God upon your people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this good day. Thank you, Lord. Stand with me, if you would, across this place. I'm going to ask Pastor Ben to come, and he's going to close us in prayer. I want you to know, church, you're loved. You're loved by your pastors. You're loved by some people right around you.